Squeaks, where are you? Squeaks, where are you? Squeaks. Oh, there you are, Squeaks. Oh, it's okay, Squeaks. Thunderstorms can get kind of loud and maybe even a little scary sometimes. But you know what? Sometimes things that are frightening are a little less scary when we understand what causes them. And we can learn what causes things by asking questions. That's why we're so glad that we heard from our friend, four-year-old Eleanor, who asked, why do lightning and thunder happen? I'm sure Squeaks would like to know. Experts called meteorologists study the science of weather, including lightning and thunder. We can use what they've learned to explain what causes these bright flashes of light and the big booms that follow. And you may not know it, but the science of what causes lightning can happen right in your own home. Have you ever walked across a fuzzy carpet and then, when you reach for a doorknob, gotten a little shock? If so, then you've been part of making a mini lightning bolt. That shock that you felt was caused by the buildup of what's known as a static electrical charge. A static electrical charge is just a little bit of electricity that stays in one place for a little while. Static electricity can build up anytime two things rub together. When you walk across the carpet, your body picks up tiny bits of charge. Then, when you reach for that doorknob, these charges jump into the metal doorknob and zap. Lightning is caused by the same thing, only on a much bigger scale. The kinds of clouds we see in thunderstorms have tiny bits of ice in them, and these little bits of ice bump into each other. They cause an electrical charge to build up inside the cloud. And as this charge keeps building up, it gets stronger. But there are two kinds of electrical charge. We call them positive and negative. Charges that are different from one another will attract or pull toward one another, a lot like magnets. But in our case, the charge in the cloud is negative. The negative charge in the cloud makes some spots on the ground get a positive charge. And when the charges in the cloud and the charges on the ground are just right, a bolt of lightning jumps between the cloud and the earth. And meteorologists have discovered that there are different kinds of lightning too. Some lightning goes from one part of a cloud to another, some jumps from cloud to cloud, and some goes between the sky and the ground. But it's all caused by a moving electrical charge. And all lightning is hot. Really hot. And that heat is what causes thunder. Thunder starts with the fact that air is made of tiny particles. When these little particles get heated up, they start to move around more quickly. So when the hot lightning bolt suddenly moves through the air, its heat makes the air particles around it all excited. All those particles of suddenly hot air start to move around quickly. They push hard against the cooler air around them. That air then flies away really fast from where the lightning was with a lot of energy. Our ears hear this movement of the air particles as a loud bang or crackle. That's thunder. So now you know, lightning happens when an electrical charge builds up inside of a cloud and moves to an opposite charge. And thunder happens when the heat from lightning causes the particles that make up air to push away from the lightning bolt. And remember, when you're not sure about something, ask questions. It just might make you feel better. <coughs> Hi guys, we just came across this spider web. Look how pretty it is. You might know some kids or adults that get kind of nervous or even afraid around spiders. In fact, one of our four-year-old viewers is kind of afraid of spiders too, but she knew exactly what to do. She wrote us and said, I want to learn about scary spiders so that I'm not afraid of them anymore. That's a great attitude. Knowledge is power. So let's all see what we can discover about spiders. One thing that you should know is that spiders have a really important job to do. They eat lots of small little insects like mosquitoes, gnats, and house flies. So if spiders weren't around to do their jobs, then there would be a lot more of these pesky insects around. Speaking of insects, some people think that spiders are a kind of insect but that's not true. You might remember how you can tell an insect from other kinds of animals. Insects have six legs, and they have three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Plus, they sometimes have other body parts too, like wings to help them fly around, and antennae to sense their surroundings. Now, spiders are different in a lot of ways. For one thing, they only have two body parts. They have an abdomen, but instead of having a head and a thorax, they have just one other body part, with the two put together called a cephalothorax. And maybe the easiest way to spot a spider is that they always have eight legs, and they don't have wings or antennae. Here's another fun fact about spiders. Spiders have different kinds of eyes than insects do. Insects have really complicated eyes, called compound eyes. They're made up of thousands of little lenses that work together so the insect can see. But spiders have simple eyes with just one lens, just like you and I do. So you actually have something in common with spiders. But if you've ever seen a picture of a spider up close, you might have noticed that spiders have more than two eyes. 
Most of them have eight eyes. One kind of eight-eyed spider is called the jumping spider. These spiders have some of the best vision of any spider in the world. Their eight eyes make them able to see almost the whole way around their bodies. But jumping spiders do something else very well too. And I bet you can guess what it is. They jump! Some of these spiders can jump up to 50 times the length of their own bodies. If you could do that, you'd be able to jump over 12 cars in a single leap. But these spiders are careful jumpers. They always stick a piece of silk called a drag line to whatever they're jumping from. So if they happen to miss what they're jumping for, they won't fall. Clever spiders. Jumping spiders are quite smart and really kind of cute, but they don't do something that lots of other spiders do. They don't spin fancy webs. For the most beautiful webs around, you should keep an eye out for spiders known as orb weavers. The word orb means round, and that's the shape we see in an orb weaver's web. A nice, pretty circle. The silk that orb weavers and other spiders use to make their webs comes from special body parts called spinnerets. Most spiders have six of these spinnerets, and they use them to spin different kinds of silk. Each kind is for a different job. Some of the silk that orb weavers use is sticky, so when an insect flies into its web, it gets caught in these threads. But orb weavers also make a silk that isn't sticky. When they want to walk around on their own webs, they keep their eight feet on those special threads. Then the spider can get to its prey and wrap it up in another kind of silk until it's ready to eat it. Now that you know more about them, we hope you feel better about our friends, the spiders. So the next time you see a spider, take a few minutes to watch it so you can learn more about it. You can also learn more by reading books and of course, asking questions. I'm thinking of an animal. It's small and furry. It can be pretty cute and it flies around at night. Can you guess what animal it is? That's right, I'm thinking about bats. Some people think bats are scary, maybe because they only come out at night, or maybe because sometimes they live in dark places, or maybe it's because some species of bats called vampire bats survive by drinking blood. But you probably won't ever run into a vampire bat. Only three species of bat are blood drinkers. The rest of them, over 1,200 species, eat fruit, nectar, bugs, and other small animals. If you ask us, bats are totally awesome. Here are just three of our favorite things about them. To start, some bats can hear their way in the dark. That's because they don't rely on their eyes like we do. Instead, bats use sound to find their way around. Have you ever yelled into a big empty room or a canyon and heard your own voice shout back at you? That's called an echo. The sound of your voice moves across the room to the walls and then bounces back to your ears. As a bat flies through the night, it does something really similar. It makes a sound and then carefully listens for the echo. And the way the echo comes back can tell the bat a lot about what's around it. This special skill is called echolocation. If the echo comes back quickly, that means there must be something pretty close to it because the sound only traveled a short way before bouncing back. But if the echo takes a long time to bounce back, then the bat knows that the object is further away. Bats can tell not only how far away something is, but also how big it is and how fast it's moving, all from using echolocation. And since bats are constantly using echolocation to figure out the world around them, you'll often see them flying around with their mouths open to keep making sounds to bounce back. Another thing we like about bats, they really like to hang out. Bats hang upside down in quiet, dark, hidden places, like the roof of a cave or the underside of a bridge. But how? When I hang upside down from the monkey bars, after a while, I start to feel like my head is going to explode. Bats can hang for a long time because their bodies are built for life upside down. The little pathways in their bodies that blood moves through, called arteries, have special valves in them that only let blood through one way. As the bat's heart beats, the blood has to keep moving through its body in just one direction. That keeps the blood from getting stuck in the bat's head when it's hanging upside down. That's a pretty neat trick, but you know another thing that's easy to like about bats? They make really great moms. Bats usually have one baby, called a pup, in a year. At the beginning of that pup's life, it clings to its mother's belly all the time, while the mom wraps her wings around it. Maybe we should stop calling good snuggles bear hugs and start calling them bat hugs. And thousands of moms and their pups can live together in a huge group, 
called a nursery. Even when it's cold outside, the nursery stays warm because of all those bats hanging close together. Plus, when mom needs to go out and find food, she can just drop her baby off at the nursery with all the other moms and pups. When she comes back, you might think it'd be hard to find her baby again. I mean, there are thousands of pups that look just like hers. But bats and their pups can recognize each other through their smells and their voices. So when a pup calls out, the mom can fly right to it. It would be like trying to find your family in the middle of a crowded amusement park, except all of the other kids at the park are calling out for their parents too. So what do you think? Aren't bats scary cool? They have super sensing abilities, they can hang out upside down, and they are marvelous moms. Believe it or not, there's something a lot like this inside of you and inside of me too. It's a skeleton. You may have seen skeletons, like the ones they have of dinosaurs in a museum, or maybe plastic models of human skeletons, like this. Maybe you've even seen dancing skeletons around Halloween. But do you know how important, cool, and powerful your skeleton really is? Let's get to know your bones, from how they help you move to the different kinds you have and the super special job they have to do. Let's get started. One of your skeleton's important jobs is, of course, to hold your body up. Your muscles are strong, but they need a frame, something to hold on to. Without a skeleton, you'd be all loosey-goosey, and you wouldn't be shaped like you. And it goes both ways. Without your muscles, your skeleton would just be a pile of bones. It's only by squeezing and relaxing your muscles that you're able to move Move your bones. So that silly dancing Halloween skeleton? It's just pretend, because it doesn't have muscles. So your bones are hard enough to hold the weight of the rest of your body, but they're also hard enough to act like a protective shield around your soft, squishy organs. Your ribs, for example, are bones that protect your lungs and heart, so that even if you get a big, strong bear hug, your insides don't get squeezed too. And speaking of strong, the strongest bone in your body is also the biggest, longest, and heaviest bone you have. It's the bone that goes from your hip to your knee, called the femur. And that bone has to be big and strong because when you run, jump, walk, or even just stand still, a lot of the weight of your body falls on your femurs. Now, where do you think your smallest bone might be? The very smallest bone you have is actually in your ear. This little bone called the stapes looks kind of like a stirrup. Even in adults, it's only about the size of a grain of rice. But this tiny bone has a big job. When sounds enter your ear, they make this little bone move back and forth. These vibrations are what your ears pick up as sound. So without this teeny tiny bone, you wouldn't be able to hear. Now, I have a question. How many bones do you think we have? Well, it kind of depends. It sounds crazy, but you have fewer bones now than when you were born. Newborn babies have about 300 bones, but by the time you're finished growing, you'll only have 206. So where did all those extra bones go? Nowhere. As babies grow, some of their bones grow together or fuse into one bigger bone. For example, your skull. Your hard noggin is actually 21 bones that are fused together, plus one bone that's always separate your jaw. Your skull starts out as a bunch of separate bones because that leaves lots of room for your brain to get bigger. And once you're fully grown, the fused parts make an incredibly strong shield to protect your precious brain. One final fun fact about your skeleton, your bones are alive. Even though we often think of skeletons as not living, like the ones we see in museums or models, your bones are full of living cells. Some of these cells are what make your bones grow and repair them if they get hurt. And other cells, which are tucked away in the thick spongy layer deep inside your bones, have a very special job. They make your blood. That's right, most of the stuff that's in your blood is actually made inside your bones. It's because your bones are alive that they're able to grow, like they're doing in you right now. And they won't be done until you're about 25 years old. But even then, your bones will still be busy holding you up, helping you here, and making your blood. So bones in museums are cool, and Halloween skeletons are fun, don't get me wrong, but nothing's more scary powerful than your own living skeleton and all the great stuff it does for you. Hi everyone, I've been looking for Squeaks all morning. I know he's around here somewhere, but I can't seem to find him. Squeaks, buddy, where are you? <gasps> oh, it's just you, Squeaks. Jeez, you scared me. 
Apology accepted. I know you're only trying to surprise me. For a second there, when you scared me, I felt myself want to run away really quickly. And then when I realized it was just you, that feeling went away. You must have triggered my fight or flight response. Oh, well, the fight or flight response is something that happens when animals like us get scared because we want to get to safety as quickly as possible. It's okay to feel scared sometimes. It happens to everyone, even grown-ups. If we're scared and our brains decide that we need to get somewhere safe quickly, there are two main things that can happen. Sometimes our brains will decide on the fight option so that we can scare away whatever is scaring us. Without really meaning to, we might suddenly feel angry and even try to fight whatever scared us. Other times, our brains will decide on the flight option. <laughs> Good guess, Squeaks, but it doesn't mean that we can fly. Flight is another way to say running away. If our brains choose flight, we might feel even more scared than before and want to run away from whatever scared us as fast as we can. For either fight or flight, we don't really make the choice ourselves. Our brains and our bodies just react without us thinking about it. It might sound strange, but our brains are trying to get us to safety quickly, so it doesn't give us time to really think about what we want to do. Fight or flight is an instinct, something our brains and bodies do naturally without us thinking about it. It's the brain's way of protecting us. When we get scared, our brain sends signals all over our bodies preparing for action. It makes our heart and lungs work faster to get energy to our muscles so that we can run really quickly or fight really hard. It even makes our eyes focus better so we can see things moving more easily. Our bodies will stay in fight or flight mode until we're safe. <sighs> Oh, I am a little bit tired now, Squeaks. The fight or flight response put my body into overdrive. So many of my muscles and organs got ready to leap into action, and now I can start to feel how much energy went into that response. If your brain goes into fight or flight mode, you may not notice what's going on with your body very well. But once you realize everything's okay, your brain allows you to think clearly again, and you might notice that you're really tired, hungry, or thirsty. Whew, I sure am glad that it was only you trying to surprise me, Squeaks, and not something really scary. And I'm glad I didn't run away too too far. That's a good idea, Squeaks. Squeaks says that when we feel ourselves getting scared, it might help to take a deep breath in and then a deep breath out really slowly, like this. This can help our brains stay out of fight or flight mode so we don't feel as scared. I have an idea. Let's give it a try. I'll close my eyes and you go hide somewhere. Ready? Squeaks? Squeaks, where are you? Squeaks? <sighs> oh, that worked pretty well. I felt scared for a moment, but my breathing gave me enough time to realize that it was only you and I felt better. But just in case, let's go play something a little less scary, like chess. <laughs>